oh, I have the wrong file opened up. <laughs> I beg your um, patience. There we go. Um, attention threads its way through this gospel. Uh, it's introduced here at the beginning. Some will recognize Jesus' divine origins, and some will only recognize his human origins. Philip introduces Jesus as the Messiah and the son of Joseph when he tells Nathaniel. But Nathaniel, rightly skeptical, um, and then Philip simply responds, well, we'll come and see. Some may then find it odd that re Jesus reveals the most about himself to the one who expressed skepticism and doubt. Nathaniel's response is more than just recognition, it's confession. In some ways, he's the first person in the Gospel of John to proclaim who Jesus is. And then Jesus says, you will see even greater things. It's a plural you, meaning y'all, like everybody who's listening, including us. You will see even greater things. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him who Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's a whole nother sermon. Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to them, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. you will see greater things. This icon on the screen is of Jesus and Philip and Nathaniel. And in the background, you can see there's a tree, the fig tree under which Nathaniel was first sitting. It's like Jesus is saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. Greater things. Je John's Jesus makes this bold, wild claim. You'll see heaven opened. Angels will have an escalator to and from the divine real estate to visit upon the Son of Man, presumably Jesus. What kind of things can we expect alongside Nathaniel to see amazing and awesome things? I recently learned about something I think is pretty great and awesome, amazing, unicycle football. Yes, unicycle football. <laughs> it's football, American style, on unicycles. <laughs> it's great to watch. <laughs> I wish I could show you a video and encourage you to do the likewise. It was, it's about as great as when I got to watch as an eight or nine year old, grown men play donkey baseball, wrap your head around that, as a fundraiser at Salt Lake Park in my hometown. My dad cheated and used sugar cubes, <laughs> which didn't actually help, turns out. Unicycle football was invented by Marcus Garland, who lives in, where else, Texas. I wanted so much to show you a video clip, but I, I wasn't able to pull that together. They say it's slower than regular football, but I don't think so. It is hilarious, I have to tell you, and pretty great. What, what we as a culture, well, as a country, as a community, or a fan base, 
think is great is in the eye of the beholder. You may not think it's so great unicycle football, <laughs> but we as individuals and groups of individuals consider to be great is greatly influenced by our social, economic, and regional location, our limitations and our aspirations. What of all the stories that are deemed not great enough to make their way into the pages of our history books? Rogue History is a series on public television of short stories about the stories that don't get told in our history books. The first season delved into the world of pirates on the high seas, the rogues, right? Episodes now include stories about the people who cracked an impossible Soviet code, the misunderstood legacy of ninjas, yes, and how a Spanish chicken farmer tricked Hitler. We should all be very grateful for Mr. Garcia <laughs> because he tricked Hitler. In the latest episode, I saw host Joel Cook told the story of the Knights of Liberty, a top secret, all black militant organization who prepared to launch the largest enslaved rebellion in American history. But before they did, secret orders were given and called it, and it was called off. And if you're wondering, gee, why, golly, why isn't that wasn't in my history book? Well, then you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> in 1846, Moses Dixon, who was a traveling barber, later became a reverend, convened a secret meeting in St. Louis to, as he put it, prepare for business. His plan called for the infiltration of Southern states to recruit men, black men, who were courageous, patient, temperate and possessed of sound common sense. Recruits were required to take an oath of secrecy unto death. After 10 years, presumably in 1856, after those 10 years of training, the Knights of, Lab of Liberty would launch a war on slavery. The participants in the meeting were Dixon and 11 trusted friends. They became known as the Order of the Twelve. And they spread out across the South to establish the organization, creating a, an infrastructure, a relational infrastructure that made an immediate impact on the Underground Railroad. When he was interviewed in 1901, Dixon said the Knights operated a network capable of moving freedom seekers all across the United States. Developing this relational infrastructure was, was critical for this kind of daring and dangerous work, and it took time and building trust. They were organizing. The Knights of Black Liberty had a plan. They wanted to seize land for black people in the South, where they were enslaved. The plan was to attack Atlanta and then establish a stronghold of black resistance. You can see why this wasn't in our history books. Dixon's parents were born into slavery and as a child, he experienced race riots in Cincinnati in 1829 that were intended to drive black people out of the city. He lived through Nat Turner's rebellion, which failed. He said, we know of the failure of Nat Turner and others. Previous rebellion leaders struggled with stealth and planned for just weeks or months without building a real infrastructure to support their operations. Dixon gambled that a large army with 10 years of training gave them that chance. And as I said, orders were called off in 1856 because it was clear to Dixon uh, with the skirmishes on the Kansas-Missouri border happening that war was coming, it was inevitable. The Union Army relied on intelligence provided by black people, even though they were not allowed to serve at the onset of the war. And no records remain about 
where they got their intelligence, but I, it's within reason to consider that the infrastructure built by the Knights of Liberty made it possible for the Union Army to get that evidence, that intelligence, for it to be gathered and delivered to them. The organizing work the Knights of Liberty engaged in for 10 years and beyond was not in vain and was, simp and was used for more creative, life-giving endeavors after the war. After the war, the Civil War, the network remained intact and they transitioned, they pivoted into a mutual benefit society called the International Order of Twelve Knights and Daughters of Tabor. Dixon played a major role in organizing schools for black Americans in St. Louis, served as a founding member of what is now Lincoln University of Missouri. It's one of the oldest historically black universities in the nation. His legacy continued through Taborian Hospital, one of the first hospitals in the country with an all black staff. Blacks weren't allowed in white hospitals and if they were, it was around the back and without much service. Well, I think this is pretty great. The outcome of what happened with the infrastructure built by the Knights of Liberty, the kind of hospitality that they were able to provide to people who had been enslaved and continued to be oppressed. I think they saw greater things than they could have even imagined in 1846. They provided a network of angels traveling the countryside who provided the foundation for building a future for a once enslaved people. And the interaction between Nathaniel and Jesus in the gospel is a curious one to me as he only appears in the gospel of John, Nathaniel. This scene disrupts preconceived concepts of greatness even opens us to the reality of true greatness, which is God alone. Only God is great, and the revealing of divine activity is great, which is what Jesus was all about, being the bridge between the here and now, heaven and the earth, the eternal and the transient. Mike talked last week about theophanies, those inexplicable moments when God or something that feels sacred shows up in whispers or flashes of glory. John's gospel wants to show the entirety of Jesus is theophany, is the revealing, is God breaking through the bonds of the finite and the ephemeral. It's been my experience that theophanies don't require heightened spiritual experiences. They often occur in the most mundane of places. They happen among communities committed to the stabilizing presence of Christ and living that presence. I think Moses Dixon and the Knights of Liberty and Daughters of Tabor sought to live from that presence as they created community and hope for the people in their community. I think First Christian Church of Pomona does that. And we've been doing it for 140 plus years now. Being a stabilizing presence in community for one another, for our community in which we live and the communities beyond as we practice Christ here. I hope and pray that each of us will see in the everydayness of our lives the theophanies of God happening all around us all the time and let those lead us. Amen.